Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Thanks, Tom, again for being here to answer the questions that come in from either the YouTube viewers or to our email or to the fireside chat that we sometimes don't get to answer. So the first question we have is from a Miss D and she is going through a tough time. She decided to leave her husband of 13 years with her two children. It was an abusive relationship. Many emotional and verbal abuse and controlling behaviors were involved in this, in this relationship. I'm very loving and loved him and was hoping to spend our life together and raise our kids together, but it was not meant to be. I still love him. We have not spoken for over five months and maybe never again. He doesn't see the children and perhaps won't see them again. He loved us, but had big anger issues, which he could not control. I would happily have gone back to him to give it another chance, but there was no guarantee that his anger would not return and make him even more abusive towards us. I feel sorry for all of us as anger is the main cause for the family being torn to pieces, but no one talks about anger. There are anger management programs out there, but I'm not sure how successful they are. I believe anger is a byproduct of perhaps mental health issues. He was always worried and anxious about the future or future events. How can MBT ensure that people can manage their anger to become better humans? He was an angry person when I married him and I thought I can change him, but he ended up changing me instead. The big problem which has caused many families to split up. What can a person do to combat their anger problem, and how can others around the angry person help him? Okay. Yes, anger is a very big problem. And there's many different sources of anger. Of course, each person has to, you know, deal with their own issues that cause anger. There's nothing you can do to fix somebody else other than give them an environment in which it makes it easier for them to fix themselves. But even if you try to do that, it doesn't guarantee they will try to fix themselves. Typically the anger is a result of an ego problem, which is the result of a fear problem. So fear is at the root of it. And also belief sometimes is, is part of that that anger as well depends on each individual. The way that often works is that people feel insecure. They're not so sure they are what they should be, what they need to be. They feel small, sometimes not very um, competent, not very powerful, not able to uh, I don't know, perform in the way they'd like to. Now, whether that's because they're comparing themselves to somebody else, or whether that's because when they were young, they were always told they were wrong, and always uh, maybe put down by family or something. There's all sorts of reasons why somebody might feel that way or have that sort of fear. But it's almost always a fear about self, negativity about self. And when you're negative about self, you try to cover that over. You don't want to feel that. That fear feels bad. It's, a, it's something you try to escape. And that's where the ego comes in. The ego helps you escape. The ego says, oh, you're okay. Everybody has some, some anger problems. And, you know, anger is just a natural uh, response to something horrible, you know. There's, that's not a problem. So the ego comes in and tells you it's all okay. Helps you ignore it. Helps you pretend it doesn't exist. But when something happens that kind of rubs your nose in that insecurity, when something happens that 
that kind of points at you and says, well, you didn't do that right. You made a mistake. You're not perfect. You're not competent. You're not whatever their fear is that they're not. When somebody kind of points to that fear, their response is anger, denial and anger, denial that no, it's not me, I am too adequate. No, I didn't make a mistake. I am too perfect. You know, they, they have this need to not express or, or, to, or they cannot deal with the idea of their own imperfection. Because that imperfection is something that bothers them. They feel negative about themselves. Okay, so if you feel uh, negative about yourself and somebody says something like, well, why didn't you do that? Instead of taking that as instructive criticism or as just somebody trying to help out, they'll take that as, as somebody has seen that they did it wrong. And if they did it wrong, then they can't stand that because it just vibrates. It just resonates with that, that, that fear of being inadequate. So if somebody points out that, uh, well, why didn't you do it this way? Instead of saying, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Or, okay, thanks, maybe I will. Or, well, I really like the way I'm doing it, you know, myself. And I like my way better and just going on with things not getting angry, just dealing with the information, a person who feels negative about themselves will get angry because they will interpret that, why didn't you do it this way, as a criticism. And that criticism resonates with their fear of being inadequate. And their reaction is anger. And if the other person tries to say, well, we'll, we'll back off, all I did is suggest another way of looking at it, and that will just make it worse. Because now you've said that they need to look at it a different way because there's something wrong with them. You see, that's how they'll get it. So then they get worse. And the more you try to, to explain, the more you try to, to point out that they're being unreasonable with being angry over such a, you know, it's just a comment. Well, everything just goes to hell in a handbasket. It just keeps getting worse. So your best thing to do is just be quiet. When you've triggered that anger, you need to just let that anger person rant and get it all out of the system, stay positive, and then either agree to it, apologize, I'm sorry you feel that way, or, and of course, if you say that, I'm sorry you feel that way, they'll come back with something else angry. Well, yeah, you always make me feel that way. You're always putting me down when you really didn't put them down at all. And rather than argue, you just have to say, well, I'll try not to do that in the future. Change the subject and go on. In other words, it is useless to respond to it with explanation, with trying to get them to see where they are and where they're coming from. It just won't work. So you just be positive to it, let it go, and it'll burn itself out. And in a couple of days, they'll forget all about it with a little luck. Depends on how angry and how upset they got. Maybe take a couple of weeks. But meanwhile, you try not to trigger those things that make them feel negative about themselves. Even though you, know, you didn't criticize them, you didn't say anything other than point out another option, you see. But the person who okay with buttons, you know, these are emotional buttons. If somebody pushes your button and you, you turn on and get angry, well, all these buttons are just tied to fears. So what can you do about it? Well, if you have to live with somebody like that, you need to be able to manage their, their anger without being angry yourself, you, without even explanation, without any kind of, of uh, defense. Oh, but I didn't mean that you had made a mistake. I just was offering another idea that will make it worse. So you can't explain. You can't defend. You have to just let it run out until they have vented. And when they've finished venting, anything you say next, whatever it is, they will vent a little more. 
because they're still angry. So even if you say, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you upset like that, they're still going to reply with, yeah, what you always do, because they're still angry, you see. So you let that vent too and say, well, I'll try not to do that anymore. And he'll say, yeah, I've heard that before because they're still angry. So you see, you're not going to get them to a point. So your best just to be quiet, be nice, say a few things that you have to say, but try to be on, you know, try to say those things that don't fuel the anger, which means it has to be something positive about them. You have to say something about how great they are or how wonderful they are or how smart they are and so on. If you say things that are positive about them, then that will unpush the button and suddenly they'll feel a lot better because now you've said something positive about them and as opposed to that negative thing that they interpreted it being negative that you said about them, even though it wasn't really negative at all, they just interpret it that way. Now, why do they interpret it that way? Because when you're fearful, you start to interpret everything in terms of your fear. So if you're fearful and you feel insecure and, and you go out and you're next to a person like that and you say, wow, what a nice day. Wow, the sky is really blue, isn't it? And you think, well, how could somebody get angry at that? But if the person feels very insecure, they'll say, what, you don't think I know what color the sky is? You never give me any credit for anything, you see, and they'll still get angry. So it's not so much, <laughs> you know, you have, you have to be careful in dealing with people like that, because anything they will interpret as being negative toward them because they feel negative about themselves. So they interpret things negatively, even when they're not implied negatively. And to try to explain that to them is not working. So that's how you get along with a person like that. You just let them be and they will get over it. And when they get over it, then you can enjoy your life with them as a non-angry person. And you just have to learn what to say, what not to say. Never be defensive. Never try to explain or defend what it is you've done that upsets them. Just let it be. So that's what you can do, and that's how you interact with a person like that. And what can you do to help them outgrow it? Well, you can give them as much positive stuff as you can. In other words, tell them things that are positive about themselves, things that are good about them. Even if you have to stretch a little bit you know, to come up with things, think about what could you say to them that makes them feel good about themselves? In as much as they could feel good about themselves will improve their probability of one day dealing with that fear. You see, so that makes a hard situation for most people, because when most people are around an angry person, then they get angry too. I just said, why don't you try something else? You know, why are you so angry? And now they're angry and everybody's angry and the whole thing just devolves into a big anger fest. That's because both people have fear. <laughs> both people are interpreting things negatively. Everybody interprets that the other person is criticizing them. And everybody's button is pushed and everybody argues and fusses. And that's very unhealthy. Okay. So in a relationship, you can have a good relationship, even if just one person is able to love unconditionally. Okay. The relationship is a lot nicer if both people can love unconditionally for everybody. It's, it's, it's nicer, but you can have a good relationship just with one person who can love, you know, without any requirements, you know, unconditionally. But it's not easy because most people aren't that good at being able to give unconditionally. They want and expect something back. They don't want to be barked at. They don't want to be fussed at. They don't want to have to put up with a lot of negativity. So they push back. And then the pushes against pushes and eventually relationships 
degrade to where they come apart. Well, the thing is, is that that happens and you need to learn from it. So if a relationships come apart, you need to think about it and say, well, what could I have done differently? You know, was this the best thing that was the coming apart, a real positive thing for everybody? And you have to think of everybody, which would include the kids and, and you know, I don't know who else, who else would be immediately involved, but everybody who's immediately involved, involved with it. Is it the best thing for everybody? And you might think, yes, because all that fussing and arguing and negativity wasn't good environment for anyone. Certainly not a good environment for kids to grow up in, where their parents are always complaining and fussing and fighting with each other is a horrible environment to raise kids in. So you may say, well, yeah, the best thing was to, to separate. But learn from it. Learn from it so that when the next relationship comes along, you'll be able to handle it better. You'll be less defensive. You'll be less needing to explain why they're wrong to somebody who you think is obviously wrong. You'll let them be however they are, and you'll be able to accept that they have negative feelings about themselves and they're very sensitive and they interpret all sorts of things that you might do or say as negative toward them, even when they're not met. So you just have to say, well, that's the way they are. That's okay. Because though there's these angry spells that aren't fun, aren't pleasant, there's non-angry spells in between that are a lot of fun and are very pleasant. So I'll interact with the pleasant things and I'll learn how to keep that negative stuff at a minimum. So then you can, you've learned. So the next relationship, you'll be better at it because almost everybody has these problems. Now, the, the man that you were with that, that uh, had them excessively, okay, perhaps he was excessive, but most everybody has these problems. Feeling insecure is just part of what our culture does to us. Okay, so you're probably in your next relationship, if there is one, going to have to deal with something similar. Maybe not as strong, maybe it won't quite be as abusive, maybe. But the thing is, these fears develop with age. And the older you get, the harder it is to keep those fears stuffed under the rug where you can't see them. They start to boil out and bubble up and you have to deal with them. That must be part of the way, you know, part of the way consciousness works. You've got things to deal with. And if you keep hiding from them and ignoring them and denying them, they just get worse and worse. All that garbage under the rug starts to smell bad. And the smell just gets worse and worse. The older you get, it's just harder and harder to, to get away from it. So when you deal with people, even though that anger maybe is very mild, you know, when you first get married or the first four or five years of your relationship, but as people open up and become more themselves and as they grow up and that fear puts more pressure on them, it's likely to get a little worse with time unless they can actually outgrow it and let go of that fear. Now, how could they do that? Well, there's all sorts of ways, you know. Um, they may talk to a mental health specialist or something and say, hey, I've got this fear and it makes me angry. Is there something you can do about it. You know, they may do that. They may just learn to meditate. They may, uh, if they become aware that they have an anger problem, well, that would be a big step in the right direction. You know, so perhaps they'll get over it and then you won't have the anger problems. Or maybe you'll have different anger problems that aren't quite so bad. But anyway, it's a thing that you'll deal with everywhere in life. You'll deal with it at the office. You'll deal with it with your children. You'll deal with it with your children's teachers. You'll deal with it with your next door neighbor because almost everybody is full of fear. And that fear gets expressed when that fear gets resonated, when that fear gets tweaked, when that fear button gets pushed, you're going to see a lot of unpleasant anger come out. Anger is the, is the way we express 
something that we don't really want to see and we're upset about, so we blame it on somebody else. You see, it's somebody else's fault. And we get angry at those other people because they make us feel bad. And we feel bad because we have the fear. So that's the mechanism of it, that's how it works. And you've been through a lot. Learn from it. Grow yourself up. That's the only really active thing that you have control over is yourself. Grow yourself up. Grow yourself so that when it comes to your neighbor and your kids' teachers and your coworkers and all the rest of those people, you'll be able to deal more effectively with, those, with that fear. Now, people tend to hold that in unless you get to know them really, really well. So you don't get quite as much of that with your coworkers and whatever, unless you've really been with them a long, long time. Because in a work situation, everything is kept impersonal. Sh relationships are shallow. And people don't show as much of themselves in shallow relationships. They hide that sort of stuff. Yes, they get annoyed with things, but they stuff it down and don't express it because it's inappropriate in the work environment. And you don't want everybody to know how wild you get, you know, when you get angry. So you, you push it down. But when you get to a significant other relationship or somebody you live with, somebody you spend all day with every day, year in and year out, well, it's hard to keep that superficial. What and who you are down at the core just bubbles up and you're going to have to deal with it. Thank you, Tom. I hope that helps. Um, our next question comes from Mary. Now, I know you remember Jürgen Ziva. He, he joined us at mm -hmm. one of our events in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, Mary and, and is, he joined an event with me in Germany. Oh, yes. He mm -hmm. was on that TV program with mm -hmm. you. That's right. Um, Anyway, lovely gentleman. Um, Mary's confused about, um, and this question comes up a lot. It's the afterlife question. It is, um, Mary says, uh, you say we die quickly. We forget about the life we've just lived here on earth. And we begin to see things from the perspective of our higher self, who carries all of the knowledge and the quality of of what we've accumulated over our lifetimes. We then plan or have planned for us our next incarnation and are reborn. The character we previously played no longer exists. If we contact someone on the other side, is it the LCS playing that person because that person no longer exists? Jürgen and others have described a consensus kind of cities where many people live, it seems, though temporarily. Mm -hmm. um, does the higher consciousness that played Jürgen's mother take on her form only for Jürgen's sake or the LCS does? Jürgen has said that his mother has explained to him about all kinds of things she is learning and experiencing there. Mm -hmm. So we sometimes spend a good deal of time learning and experience in that reality before we're born again is her question also um it's absolutely wonderful to think that we are part of the lcs um she cried such tears of joy when i f fully came to understand this um i've been watching a lot of stuff from the spiritists and jürgen and it got me to thinking about the time between lives I think there's an important point here when we say time between lives. Uh, when Jürgen was talking about meeting his mother in his book, my first thought was what you have said. We are reborn fairly quickly. And if we are talking to Uncle John in the afterlife, it would be the LCS because Uncle John no longer exists. Now, I know your one of your explanations mm -hmm. is the... Um, Uncle John was the IUOC or part of the LCS before he was John. So it is very logical that that information that was John would be 
the LCS. But Jurgen goes on to describe how his mother is having experiences and mm -hmm. evolving, and he's met with her many times. So now that I'm writing this out to you, an understanding came to me. Does it really matter if it's Jurgen's mother, the IUOC or the LCS, because they are one and the same? Uh, so what does, what, you know, so really what does matter? Uh, I posed this question to Jurgen as well because it was his experience, um, his ex it was his experiences as well that brought up the question for me. And he does see things a bit differently from you on this matter. Mm -hmm. So how would you, how would you respond to that? Or... Well, I think the, the, the aha moment that came to her, like, does it really matter? Was a really good aha moment. And I turned that just a little bit to say that what does matter, yes, you know, it doesn't really matter so much what happens to people. It doesn't really matter so much what your experience is. What matters is how you react to that, if you grow from it. So it's not really important trying to pick apart Jurgen's experience. Oh, was that really his real mother? Was that a stand-in mother played by the LCS? You know, was this or that, you know? It doesn't matter. What matters is what Jurgen is learning from it. How he develops, okay? That's the important thing what experience he has is not so important. And that's the same with all of us all the time, whether we're sitting here and, you know, stuff happens to us, whatever that stuff is, what's important is how we deal with it, what we learn from it, how we can grow from it. How can we make positive choices with it? Not the details of the experience itself. They really don't matter. Now the LCS wants us to grow up, wants us to learn, from our experience. And it will give us pretty much whatever experience we need to do that. And it can do that in multiple reality frames. When you're dreaming, you get a different reality frame. You get different situations, different choices, and you interact with those choices and make, you know, you grow up or you, you know, you evolve or you de-evolve based on it. When you have a dream and in that dream you were, you know, what, met with somebody and you talked to that somebody and maybe you were sitting in a coffee shop and drinking coffee, do you come back and say, oh, was that a real coffee shop? What kind of coffee was that? Was that real coffee or was that coffee instant coffee? You know, well, you don't care, right? That's not important. It's how did you interact? What choices did you make? That's what's important. We don't question, uh, does coffee really exist in the dream world? Oh, is there a dream reality where coffee would live? And this was, this is, uh, yeah, maybe instant coffee. They use instant coffee in the non-physical. You see, you're just overthinking the problem. You're creating questions that really, <laughs> they don't have answers because they're not really good questions. So Jürgen gets what Jürgen gets. And the things he gets while he's in altered states of consciousness when he's not here are things that the larger consciousness system thinks will help him grow in his life, in his understanding of reality. And the system's not necessarily trying to help him grow intellectually, you see, by feeding him facts that he can repeat, it's helping him grow spiritually. Because that's where the choices are. You know, that's how we evolve or de-evolve, not because of our intellects. We don't intellectually do things or think things or figure things out and evolve or de-evolve. We evolve because we grow up at the core. We, who we are, mostly at our intuitive level, we change. And we become gentler and kinder and more caring. And, you know, it's more about others. So that's what the growing up is. And the system will produce whatever it is we need to experience to help us grow up emotionally. Now, those things that we experience 
you know, to, to talk about them and say, oh, but how factual are they? Is that really his mother? And is his mother really in this place doing these things and so on? Ah, your insight was perfect. No, it doesn't matter. That's not important. It was important to him. And he learns from it. He has a sense of peace from interacting with his mother. He has a sense of, of a bigger picture, okay, which is good for him. And the fact that his, big, his bigger picture will conflict some with my bigger picture, eh, it's not really a big deal. You know, it's not like, well, which one's factual and which one's not? Who has factual dreams and who has dreams that are not factual? Well, it's, Tom, that's, would you that's say, the wrong question. Yeah, would you say that it is, you, you point out often that we live in individual realities and the information we receive is especially for us now, would, would the, it be a possibility that it is important for him to trust the information that he gets and therefore the LCS sets up this um, interaction with his mother, he trusts that information, whether it is really her or not. Well, in one sense, it is really her because all of the information that was her is there. Mm -hmm. um, whether it is being played by the, the LCS, which she was a part of before she mm -hmm. was the mother, is not really significant. And mm -hmm. another aspect too I'd like you to address is the uh, there is an expectation here that he acknowledges from what she's written that reincarnation is accepted. So there is a bit of a logical inconsistency in recognizing that this reality um, evolves with the concept of reincarnation. So that actually, is there a question of how long would this really be her? Because that's a possibility also. Well, and you know, how would you resolve yeah. all of those things? Well, you're, you're trying to build a structure to explain the details of the experience. So, you, well, okay, they reincarnate, but they don't reincarnate right away. They go out and have lives and, you know, do things and ride buses and talk with talk with living people and you know they do other things for a while first if they want to and so you can do that you can make a structure like that but all of that is really not relevant that's just making things up to support <laughs> you know making your experience more real okay well okay if it's a real experience then you have to say that well okay then people before they move on to the next incarnation can hang out and do other things and that's what Jurgen's doing. See, so now we make a structure that supports that. But all that's irrelevant. And yet that's just um, conjecture. We can conject anything. And as she, as she figured out there at the end, it doesn't matter. It's not important at all. He gets his experiences because those are the experiences that he needs to grow up. Now, he takes those experiences. He writes them down in a book. And there's going to be lots of people reading his books that will be comforted by those experiences that he has with his mother. They will find comfort in that. And maybe because they find comfort in that, they will be able to grow up some. They'll be able to uh, evolve. Oh, good. You see? So it helps him evolve. His books help others evolve. And, well, is that, are they facts? or not. You see, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you have an out-of-body experience, an out-of-body experience is a, is a single-player game. Okay, you are, and a lot of dreams are single-player ga games too. You get a data stream from the LCS, and in that data stream, you know, here's, here's your dream. Here's your out-of-body experience, and that is your experience. And you interact and you make choices. But we come back and we say, gee, was that a real experience? Or was that a fake experience? There isn't anything more real than information. It was an experience, an experience where you could make choices. So is it real? Of course it's real. 
by the choices you make in that out of body or in that dream, you evolve or you de-evolve. That's your whole point of being there. Anything that helps you do that is important to you. So this, this idea of having to know how real it is or having to build something to support it isn't necessary. It just is. So he has his experiences, which are, I would say are probably handcrafted just for him so that it gives him what he needs. And because he also writes books, he gets experiences that will help other people because the system knows that if they give them to him, he'll write about them and it'll go off to other people. So as long as he's helping people grow up with his experiences, then it's a good thing. You see, the system, when it gives me an experience in an out-of-body, it's not worried about, you know, whether that experience is justifiable as facts from the viewpoint of our virtual reality, that's kind of ridiculous. This is a virtual reality too. It's another virtual reality. It's just an experience. Any, any information defines an experience. So you get information that defines an experience. That information is valuable. It's real, nothing more real than information. So you have the experience and you do it and you grow from it and you share it and maybe other people can grow from it. And trying to have the fact squad, you know, later decide whether it's a fact or not is really beside the point. That's not, that's not an issue. So well, I say yay for Jürgen, yay for Jürgen's experiments, yay for Jürgen's mother, you know, may they all interact in a positive way and may he share that with as many people as possible because what Jürgen tends to share is very positive thoughts. He's not sharing fear. He's not spreading, you know, negativity. He's spreading very positive thoughts. And those positive thoughts tend to open people's minds, give people comfort, do other things because that's what people need. Now I don't do a lot of comfort stuff. I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, so I just lay out a model that, that says here's the bare basics that you need in order to understand all the things that happen in consciousness. You see, so that's the way my model works. So I don't add things in, I don't even call a higher self a higher self, you know, because, you know, now you have, if you, you know, I just have an IUOC there, an individuated unit of consciousness. So I try to keep it simple and straightforward and not go places that, the, that my facts, as far as the facts of consciousness, the nature of consciousness, don't require. So it doesn't mean there aren't things out there that, that I've missed. It just means that I don't, my own experience, my own I don't know, thousands of hours, you know, wandering around in the non-physical trying to do experiments there have not found logical justification for anything more than what's in my model. So that's the, that's the thing. So I want to explain everything as simply as possible. So we just say, you know, we're a subset of the LCS. That's what we are. We're just a piece of the LCS. We're not different. We're not really separate with space between us. There's no space in this consciousness. We're just a subset in computer terms. What do we call it? We're a virtual machine. You know, we're a, we're a partitioned off chunk of the LCS. So that's what we are. And when we die, all that information about us and how we did and the choices we made and who we interacted with and all our thoughts and feelings, all that remains with the LCS. And if the LCS wants to project that, back to somebody else, well, it's all part of the LCS, always has been a part of the LCS. It can project that character back perfectly, you see, without any problem. And would it ever have a need to do that? Well, maybe, maybe it had a need to add Jürgen's mother to Jürgen's explorations of the non-physical for whatever reason. And whether that's something that the system gives Jürgen because Jürgen needs it, or whether that's something that Jürgen created because Jürgen needs it, or whether that's something else, doesn't matter. You see, those are, those, are not, those are not good questions. 
It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter at all. So it's just, it's something Jurgen gets. He interacts with it. He learns from it and he shares it. That matters. I think it's beautiful what you said that Jurgen's experience gives comfort to others. Now, your model is a a bare bones scientific uh, model. You've, you've determined, you know, what is, what is necessary for this theory of consciousness to work, this big theory of everything, but everyone, you have to acknowledge that everyone is different in their experiences and what they need. And to criticize your model, because it's, it seems cold and aloof and scientific is not the point either. If you identify with what Jurgen has set out, has created, has experienced, that's beautiful. If you need to meet up with your relatives, that will happen. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, Is, if, if, I mean, if your that's growth, not... Yeah, if your growth could be accelerated, you know, dramatically, not just a teeny little bit, but dramatically by meeting any any of your dead relatives or anybody else or any other spirit or any guide or anything else then that is likely to happen because the system wants you to succeed your success is its success you're just a piece of the system itself so of course yes those things will happen so our trying to put everything in a pigeonhole because that's what we do here in this virtual reality right that's what science does you know everything's separate and everything has to go in its own pigeonhole and everything has to have uh, some sort of uh, causal chain. This causes that and that causes that. Well, that's the nature of our virtual reality and our rule set. In the bigger picture of consciousness, you just have consciousness and you have a lot of individuated units of consciousness who are trying to grow up. And we all send data to each other. We make up data out of our own mind and we get data from the LCS three places the data comes from right lcs ourselves other iuses now the data we get is coming from one of those three you'll never know for sure with you know absolute certainty where your data is coming from and that's why it doesn't really matter where the data is coming from so it could come from your own self because your consciousness and you can create information there's other iuocs and they can create and share you know mind to mind information and it can come from the lcs because it's conscious and it can make information and share it with you so most of the time most iuocs aren't aware of who and what they are so they're not that busy passing mental things around to each other so typically that's the weaker of the two links you don't get so much of that except in places where people are more aware and they do send a lot of thoughts around and when they send things unintentionally you know they're just thinking out loud or they're thinking of something that that triggers you you know how that happens when you think oh i haven't thought of my old friend haven't seen him for 20 years but they just popped into my mind and you know a day later they call you on the phone Something like that happens. Well, that's because they're thinking of you. They are an old friend and it triggers. So there's a lot of that person, IUOC to IUOC, person to person, conscious to conscious going on uh, between people. But usually it's not that pushy or not that strong and we don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. But when we go out and open ourselves up to information, it could come from any of those three sources. The kind of information Jurgen gets is most likely to come from the LCS. Second most likely would be to come from himself. And if it comes from himself, that doesn't make it fake or not real. It's just as real, no matter where it comes from. There's there's good reasons when it comes from you. You yourself can also pose questions, put things that give you comfort, can be helpful. You know, so it's not like, well, if it comes from me and it's mine, that's just me talking to myself and that's bogus junk. No, that's not the case. The stuff that comes from you can be extremely helpful, extremely uh, elucidating. It's, It's valuable as well. So you don't know where it comes from. 
often it's a mixture of several things. You get stuff from the LCS, which mixes with your own memories and your own needs and your own stuff. And it all blends together to paint another picture. You know, that happens a lot as well. So it doesn't matter though. The thing is all that is not important. It's information. And what's important is, can I grow from this information? Can I learn from this information? Can I become love more readily with this information? And if the answer is yes, then that information is very, very important, whether it's from the LCS, from you, or some combination of, you know, all, all three sources. It doesn't matter. It only matters what we do with it. I love how you said it paints another picture because yeah. Jürgen is an artist and he does paint the pictures <laughs> and beautiful yeah. ones too. Yeah. And so that, that has a creative aspect yeah. to it. Well, typically this, it uh, is like that, Don. It is a mixture. You know, we get stuff from the LCS and then we interact with it. We interact in, in it with ways that suit us and suit our beliefs and our understandings. And we interpret that in certain ways. I mean, we can't help but add our own piece to it. It's impossible not to, because even though the system gives us information, we have to interpret it. And that interpretation has to do with us and our knowledge base, our fear, our love, all the things that we are is a, is a part of that interpretation. So we can't avoid being part of the, you know, so we do paint a picture. It's not that we get pure messages from the LCS is unlikely. You see, now the more we are able to detach from our ego and get rid of our fear, well, those messages do get cleaner and cleaner with less and less interpretation and less noise. But in general, there's a mix. Now, somebody like Jurgen or somebody like Bob Monroe, who were very, very good at going out and getting things and bringing them back, well, they've learned not to mix their stuff up so much with what they get. So when they report things, it's pretty much, you can take it the way they get it. But even then, you know, if you look at some of Bob's things, like his, his louche thing, he just got it wrong. You know, he made the wrong interpretation. He got the information, but it just wasn't interpreted quite right. And Bob had a, had a history in farming. He came out of the Midwest. His family, you know, came out of the Midwest farmers. So he gave it a farming interpretation because that was in his background. Loosh. Oh, yeah, we're like cows out in the field making loosh for somebody else. No, it's not like that. We're growing up becoming love. And in that growing up, the somebody else is the LCS, the somebody else is the larger kind of system, which is us ourselves. You know, that's who benefits from it is us and, wow. our, and, our, and our system. So he didn't get that right. But and I'm sure Jurgen puts his own spin on things. He has to. You can't avoid that. But again, it doesn't matter. It's not important. He gets a sum total that is valuable to him and valuable to others. It helps other people learn. And that makes it wonderful. That makes it valuable. And all the, 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 the kind of kibitzing and arguing about you know, the, the details are all just really not important at all. Well, Tom, thank you. This moves us into the next question. Speaking of getting it wrong, um, our friend Stephen is um, asking about, you know, near-death experiences interacting directly with the LCS. Uh, when they're given information, he finds it difficult in this, what you say is a probabilistic reality to think that the information they receive could not be 100% correct. How would mm -hmm. you uh, respond to that? Well, the problem is that we're taking the way we deal with things here intellectually, and we're imposing that on, on a, a, uh, an NDE, a near-death experience. It doesn't work that way. So let's say you gave an example earlier on of an NDE where a person, I think it was a lady, was told that one of her children was going to die, say, say three years later. Right? That, was in a, that was an NDE. So sometimes in NDEs, you get very specific information with things like that. Sometimes in meditation, a lot of times in meditation, you get things like that that are very specific. Okay, now... 
his point is, well, that's a message from the LCS. How could it be anything but true? How could it not happen? You see, then if it doesn't happen, then why? What went wrong? Did the system tell a lie? Did you get the message wrong? You know, something obviously is broken here. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Again, you get things because they are going to be helpful to you. Okay, now if you get a message like one of your children are going to die, that's a pretty heavy message. So why would somebody get a message like that? Well, maybe it'll help them deal with fear. Maybe just realizing that that is a possibility. You know, mostly we don't think about things like our children dying. You only think about ourselves dying. We only think about death when it's our great-grandmother or somebody that's 90 years old. Then we think about, oh, yeah, think about them and death. But mainly when it's younger people, dying never comes into our mind. So we don't deal with it. And then if something happens, we're terribly shocked. And maybe it was just this person's time to deal with that kind of fear. And this sort of knowledge was just what she needed to, to help her deal with fear, just fear in general. Okay, so maybe that was the reason that she got it. Okay, maybe at that time, the probable reality was such that her child, because of her genetics or something else, was liable to end up with leukemia or something, who knows? And maybe that was a prediction to help her get ready for that. So when it happened, she wouldn't be devastated. She would have had plenty of time to prepare. And maybe as time goes on, those probabilities change. Oh, just because it's in your heredity doesn't mean you're going to get it and things change because now attitudes are different and so on. And now this, this daughter has some other thing that she's supposed to be doing and that just disappears. You see, so things change. So there's all sorts of reasons why somebody might get something that turns out doesn't turn or doesn't turn out to happen or doesn't turn out to be true. It, and of course, the another basic reason is is that it's easy to misinterpret the message. Okay, so say you are getting this message, you have to interpret it. So let's say there's a mother there and she's getting a message. And she gets the message that something horrible is going to happen to her daughter. And she may just jump to the conclusion and interpret that as her daughter dies. And maybe her daughter gets a divorce. Or maybe her daughter has a car accident but survives and is just fine. You see? But she misinterprets what she got. Because when she sees this horrible thing in my daughter, oh, no, her fear immediately makes a conclusion and says, oh, She's going to die. So, you see, it could have been her error in interpreting the information. Many so people would make that error. Mm -hmm. So, you see, there's lots of things that can go wrong. It's not like, well, the larger consciousness system said this, then this must happen. And if it doesn't, this whole thing is bogus. Something's wrong with it. It's yeah. not like that. There's lots of reasons why what you get is not right because you misinterpret it. You know, it wouldn't be hard for someone to jump to that conclusion, particularly one who was fearful, you know, about their children. So basically, it's not that the LCS doesn't know what it's talking about or is wrong or whatever. There's just, you have to see it from a much bigger picture. The bigger picture of the LCS is passing some information to somebody because it's going to be helpful. And that that information is helpful is is all that's needed to define that information. It's the only thing that, that's required. It doesn't have to be factual. It doesn't even have to be true. It just has to be helpful. It's trying to get people to evolve. Now, if it can, you know, if, if it would be negative or hurt people by giving them information that was not so, then it wouldn't give them information like that that was not so. So it's not going to tell you to, you know, oh, yes, you've got buried treasure left from Uncle Fred. Go dig under the next to the apple tree in the backyard of Fred's house. And then you dig and you don't find anything. And the system goes, ha, 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 just kidding. The system isn't going to do that. 
You see, it doesn't play with people. It doesn't, it's not trying to annoy or irritate. It just wants to help people. Things you get in a dream aren't necessarily factual. They're just things that you get that help you make choices, that help you grow. You know, things we just talked about with, with Jurgen, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, we trying to make all that factual is beside the point. It's useful. That's what's important. So the system will sometimes give you misinformation if it's helpful to you to grow up and not hurtful to you in any way. For instance, uh, somebody who's remote viewing and they, their ego gets really puffed up because they're good at remote viewing. And then they make a big fuss and they brag to everybody about how good they are. And when they have everybody's attention, they're gonna demonstrate their amazingness and it doesn't work. They get something not only wrong, but something really, really wrong. And the system just did that to take them down a peg or two because the ego was a problem. So the system gave them some wrong information. But that was to be helpful to them. It was to help them grow. You see, so it can do those things. Because you never know who's speaking, whether it's the LCS, an IUOC, or yourself, you should always remain skeptical of anything you get. Always remain skeptical. That's one of my you know, it's one of my mantras that's all throughout my book. You must remain skeptical of everything because you don't know the reason behind it. You don't know who's speaking with certainty, and you don't know why they're speaking. Maybe they're telling that mother that, you know, that it's just their child's going to have a big problem then, and the mother creates the, the death. That's her interpretation, and she creates that idea in her own head. Or maybe the system is telling her that, and then probabilities change because that daughter suddenly has some other kind of issue or the thing she has to do in life or whatever, and the probabilities just change. So it doesn't happen. Or perhaps the system was just trying to help the mother deal with, with death as a fear, you know, getting over that. You just don't know, you see, in any situation, you could sit down and probably make up 10 different things that could be going on there. And you don't know what the motivation is from which one of the three sources is sending you the information. So because there's no way to know that with certainty, one should always be very skeptical of everything. That's, Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the bottom that's kind of the bottom line on that. It's, it's, it's not just the black and white. Well, the LCS says it, then it must be true. Okay. Thank or the you. LCS That's is not going to lie to us. Well, yeah. it might give us some misinformation <laughs> if we need that misinformation in order to grow up. Because that's its, that's its thing is to help, us, to help us grow up. I think that's so, going to be very helpful. Um, and your message is always look to the bigger picture of things. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many variations, so many mm -hmm. variables of why that information is there, how it's interpreted. Right. I hope and I should helps. say, I should say uh, one other thing, and that is with time and with experience, you will get better and better at, at guessing what the source is. But there's always some guess. You're never 100%. Because even though it may really, really seem like this, well, the LCS can seem like anything it wants to seem like. You know, so just because it does, it's not 100%. So sometimes with practice, and you've been doing this for years, many years, then you're at the, you know, 99% or 0.99 in probability or 0.999 even. But a lot of the times you're more at 0 0.8, 0 0.7, you know, but to a beginner, they're more like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, because you don't have enough experience to really get a strong sense of where the data is coming from. So with time, you still have to be skeptical. But your skepticism is not always, I have no idea. You do have an idea. 
but you're also cautious enough to know to don't believe anything you think as 100%. You have to mostly be skeptical about yourself. Well, I wasn't wrong with the 0.999 then. Uh, we had a discussion mm. about that. And so it's never, it's never a one. So it's the highest is the 0.999. <laughs> okay. I'm glad to know that <laughs> I understood that part. Thank you very much, Tom. I hope that's helpful to all of the people who submitted the questions. And thank you all very much. Thank you too, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you, Donna. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our newly created Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.